Turn to uh, Isaiah 55. And just something on my mind from Isaiah 55. And uh, I like it. <clears throat> it says, uh, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. And he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Look at that. You have no money. And yet, the offer is to come and buy milk and wine. Now, he's not talking about Mogan David, Chateaubriand, or whatever. He's talking about the fruit of the vine, new wine. Buy wine and milk without money and without price. So when the gospel... When Jesus said in Isaiah 61, um, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And uh, I, think, I think the Luke version what I was looking for. But anyway, when Jesus read this, uh, I turned right to it. Thank you, Lord. He said... Um, um, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. The best place in the world to preach the gospel is to the poor. Because it doesn't require any payment. Okay? Now, I've heard the, the idiots on TBN turn that around and said, obviously, there's something about the gospel that makes you rich. That's why it's to the poor. So you, if you have the gospel, you'll be rich. I just like to shoot all of them. You just like to have them all stand up, you know, like a carnival and just go ping, 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 ping. I'm not that mean, but when these guys start messing with the gospel, it, it infuriates me because saying it like that is a trap that people are led into to make them think that if they get saved, then they're going to get rich. And when these people don't get rich, then these same preachers say, obviously, you're not saved. That makes me mad. So he said, if you have no money, come ye buy and eat, eat, yea, come, buy wine and milk without money, without price. Why, wherefore, do you spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear, and come unto me, and hear, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. You know what that was? The sure mercies of David? That's when he told David, huh? That he would never take his mercy from him. Never. Okay? The sure mercies of David. Uh, but that, that right there tells you how much the gospel costs. Nothing. Leave your money. Come and buy wine and buy milk without money and without price. It's free. It's free. And I had a guy several years ago that would... Uh, he thought he liked me. He would listen to the videos. And, oh, I like my Concord. And he would send money and make donations. And then I preached one time on free grace. Grace, absolutely free. Well, that was the end of the money. And then he starts making videos about me. My Concord's a liar. He's a liar, and I have 50,000 verses from the Bible to prove it. And I'm going, you don't either. If you want to prove me a liar, all you need is one verse. Amen. I'm a liar, okay? Amen. All right, let's go, um, let's go back to Revelation 19. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. And it's just good to have you here tonight. Good to see everybody here. And, man, that snow was coming down there for a while, wasn't it? And that's one of the Missouri snows. In and out. 
in less than 30 minutes. Gone. Gone in 60 seconds. So maybe, maybe Tuesday we get one of them hefty ones. All right? Make everybody happy except some people. Okay? Isaiah 19. This is when our Lord's coming. Keep, keep this in mind as I'm going through this. There's a lot here to preach on. And I'm glad God led me in this direction. Because this is it. This is Christ and how the Bible describes him as he's coming to establish his kingdom. Okay? And what you see is at different times in the Bible, Christ is described different ways. It's not because he's a different God. He's the same God, but he has all these things that he does and here at his second coming he's not coming as the gentle little lamb that's going to be sacrificed for man's sins that's already been done he's coming now as a as a lion of the tribe of judah roaring against the shepherds because he's not afraid of them and he's establishing his kingdom if you've ever if you ever want to hear something neat Go on YouTube and pull these up, a how a lion roars to notify everybody around that this is his territory. It is the, mo it is the neatest thing I've, I think I've ever seen, but when a lion detects any, any creature or any opposing lion, or the hyenas are close by or whatever, or if he, he detects men that, he's not, that he doesn't trust and doesn't know, He'll issue a series of war roars that are meant to establish you're in my territory or you're fixing to get on my territory and I'm warning you right now to back out slowly or I'll tear you apart, okay? Lions can do that. Lions can do that. Revelation 19, I saw heaven open, verse 11. Behold, a white horse and him that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth goeth the sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and, the, and he treadeth the winepress, of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. I love it. Amen? Heavenly Father, uh, we love your coming. We are looking for your appearing in the air. We are looking forward to the day that we appear with you in the clouds we're looking forward to the day that we could have the supper with you we're looking forward to the day that we could return with you to come back and set this world straight father we love it we rejoice lord i i lord i rejoice sitting there watching the president i rejoiced at what he said i wanted to get up and shout at some things he's saying and lord if if I rejoice just over what a man says that he wants to do for our country, I'll rejoice evermore when Christ is ready to come and set this whole world straight and not just make promises, but do it. Father, I just thank you, Lord, for your word, and I pray to your God that you'd bless each and every heart. Father, thank you for Sister Bonnie calling, and I pray to your God that, uh, Lord, as she goes to see her sister, Lord, she's going to be praying for her sister, praying over her sister. And God, I just pray, dear God, that you'd hear the prayers of a dear sister who's looking upon the very, very sick body of someone that she loves dearly. And God, those tears are real. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would hear her prayers, not only for her recovery, but for her salvation. Lord, help us, dear God, to have a heart for people that may be on death's door and we may be the only chance that they have to hear the gospel. 
So, Lord, help us, dear God. Put it in us. Show us, Lord, what you would have us to say. But help us, dear God, to make a difference in somebody's life this week, this month, this year. Thank you, dear God, for calling us and for using us. And, Lord, continue to do that. We're your church. You can do with us what you want, Father. We serve you and we serve your kingdom. We love you. We ask your blessings on tonight as we study your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, amen. Look up on the screen. Ain't nothing there. That's all right. I did that on purpose, by the way. Uh, let's look at this issue of, well, last Sunday we were talking about Christ being faithful. This week we were looking at the issue of Christ being true. So I'm going to throw some verses out. You either just listen to me or you'd get real fast at turning in your Bible. Revelation 3, verse 7. Turn back there, okay? And I'll, I'll make it a point to turn in my Bible. That way I'll give you a, a sporting chance, all right? Revelation 3, verse... Oh, Jerry Clower talked about when he was uh, coon hunting. Said him and his buddies would go out coon hunting and there was one of them that uh, he always said, you always got to give the coon a chance. And he said, when you go coon hunting, you either climb the tree and make the coon jump out of the tree, or you take a cross-cut saw with you and you chop the tree down and get the coon down on the ground. Or, like he said, you climb the tree and make the coon jump in amongst the dogs. Give him a sporting chance. And Jerry said, a lot of times we'd make a coon jump in and amongst 20 dogs. But at least he had the option of whooping those dogs and walking off if he wanted to. It was strictly left up to the coon. So give him a, give him a chance, amen. Revelation chapter 3. I'm giving you a chance to get there in your Bible. Verse 7. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, and he that is what? He that is true. He that hath the key of David. He that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. Look down in verse 14. I mean, I love this because it's almost word for word what it later on says about Jesus and what his name is. Verse 14, unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, right? These things saith the amen. I like that. Saith the amen. What does that mean? What does it mean when his name is called amen? What does it mean? What does amen mean? No, it means keep preaching, Brother Mike. We're listening. <laughs> no. <laughs> Preach some more. Amen. Let it be established. Let it be so. Or it's like we're saying, we stand with you. We agree with you. You couldn't be more right. Keep it up. That's what it means. Okay. Jesus, his very name, his very presence means it is established. It is true, it is right, and this is how it's going to be. His name is Amen. And I, I've had people come to me, and I've seen this stuff over the years. I've had people come to me saying, Pastor, we're hearing that the word Amen is from pagan oranges. Oranges. Pagan oranges. That's a good one. <laughs> Write that one down. Pagan oranges. It's from pagan origin, because it goes back to um, Egyptian... God worship, and they had a God named Am Amen Ra. And when churches say amen, they don't know it, but they're worshiping Ra, the sun god. <gasps> now, let me tell you something. There are people who hate going to church so bad, they make up reasons why they don't go to church. And that's one of them. Well, I don't go to church. They say amen there. And because they've told themselves, and you know what I do? I give them scripture and I say, well, do you believe the King James Bible? Well, yeah. So it says right in the King James Bible that the very name for Jesus is Amen. Well, you know it does. We're going to believe that from now on. It's okay, God, you know, you're right there, okay? But Amen, say the Amen. The faithful and true witness. Now that's it right there. And now everything that you... That, that we say about this, we're saying about Christ, his physical presence, and his word. He is, the this right here, is the faithful witness. It is the true witness. 
This will win in court. In the court of your mind, this witness, when it testifies, should always be believed and help you make the decisions. Now I say in the courtroom of your mind, because what we do is that things come to us, the devil will bring ideas to us that we, in our minds, we're going to put on trial. Now, the devil is slick, and he's subtle, and he likes to use things that if we just take them at surface level, we might end up believing them. But if we actually take them and put them on trial, when we put them on trial in our mind, then we need to bring in witnesses on behalf of God himself. And the faithful and true witness that you should bring in every time is this Bible. And when God started dealing with me about the Bible issue, it wasn't the idea that, you know, the original manuscripts are true. It was nothing like that. It was the idea that my King James English 1611 translation of the Bible was absolutely true in everything that it said. It did not need retranslation. It did not need further work by some commentary. I just needed to accept and believe that the words that I was reading on that page were 100% faithful and true. And Brother Chris, when I stopped getting my Greek and Hebrew lexicon out and trying to change what the words said, when I stopped doing that, God started showing me things that I never saw before because I had this little, I had this little incapacity or disability that whenever I came across something that I didn't understand, I would say to myself, well, obviously, maybe that word's not translated right, and I would go and try to pick it apart with a Hebrew or Greek lexicon. In other words, I would try to change what it said. And I want to tell you something. You won't get anything from God doing that. You might learn a little Hebrew. You might learn a little Greek. But as far as people changing the word to fit something or to make something make better sense... It doesn't work that way. If you will just believe that the words on your page are the exact words that God wants you to know in your language, when you will do that, things will get settled in your mind. Because he is the faithful and true witness that you always bring into court with you. Okay? In fact, I'll take one step further. Brother David Gibbs runs the uh, Christian Law Association. And uh, they help churches against lawsuits that are being brought against them. And David Gibbs and his son, David Gibbs Jr., they'll tell you, they said, any time that we have an issue where a point of doctrine is going to be brought up in court as part of the lawsuit, we always use the King James. He said, and this is from a lawyer, the King James has that precision and legality of language. Who was telling me that Somebody they knew said the Bible read like a law book. Who was telling me that? Somebody was telling me out here just the other day. Who was that? Was it Ian? Might have been. Somebody told me, they said, well, we don't like reading the King James. It kind of looks like a law book to us. And I'm going, it is. It's a law book, okay? But God put the words in here that he wanted, that he knew would win all of the trials in your mind. If you'll believe it. Okay, because he's always faithful and true. Turn to uh, Jeremiah 10. Very quickly. Come on, move. Move it. Jeremiah 10. Got a lot of ground to cover. Jeremiah 10, verse 10. But the Lord... I'm there already. But the Lord is the true God. The Lord is. Now, here's, an here's another way that you can stop having the Bible retranslated. The Hebrew roots people, and probably a bunch of other sacred name people. See that third word in that verse, Lord, capital L-O-R-D. They will tell you that that is not God's name. They're lying. They're lying through their teeth, okay? And God showed me this because, and I've run this to you before, but every place in the New Testament where it quotes from the Old Testament 
And the word Lord in the Old Testament is, the, is God's name, Jehovah, okay? In four letters, Yod, He, Va, He. Every time the New Testament writers encountered that word, when they were writing it in Greek, they always used the word Kyrios, which is where we get the word curator from. A curator is a guy who runs a museum. He is the Lord of that collection, the Lord of that museum. Okay, A curator of something, he's the Lord of it. The word Kyrie or Kyrios means, Kyrie is Latin, Kyrios means Lord. That's what it means. So here's God, the Holy Spirit. As these New Testament apostles were writing down what the Holy Spirit was giving them when they were quoting Old Testament scriptures, they never wrote Jehovah. They never wrote Yahweh in Greek. They never did anything like that. What they did was they wrote down what that word means. Lord. And when it's translated, when you look at it, if you know a little Greek, you look into Greek, and it says Kyrios, you know that that word means Lord. So it's not just the King James translators botched up the Bible by not including God's real name in there. It's that the Hebrew roots people do not know God's real name. His name is Lord. Okay? They don't believe it. So what does that tell you? Look at that verse again. The Lord is the true so who's the true god john lord not some yahuwah thing that they made up his that's not what his name is his name is the lord and they say no that's his title no that's his name the lord is the true god he is the living god an everlasting king at his wrath the earth shall tremble the nations shall not be able to abide his indignation See, that fits in with what we're seeing here. When he comes, he's indignant. And he's full of wrath. And the earth is not going to be able to abide that. Turn to Jeremiah 42. Same book, different verse. Are you there yet? I am. Jeremiah 42, 5. They, then they said, watch this. Then they said to Jeremiah, I love this. The Lord be a what? That's Revelation 19. His name is faithful and true. The Lord be a true and faithful witness between us. There's a couple things I'll say this. Back in the days when Brady was a Jehovah's Witness, I would spend hours trying to find verses in the Bible that I could beat him up with. Okay? Because he had it coming. He was a snotty little 16-year-old Jehovah's Witness brat. And every now and then he'd get on the phone and he would lash into me about how I needed to be a Jehovah's Witness. And I said, Brady, if you're going to do that one more time, I'm going to hang the phone up right now. And he went, no, please don't hang the phone up. Okay, I won't. And every time I had a verse, Jared, that I thought was going to nail his hide, I'd say, uh, Brady, I got a verse for you. And I'd read the verse, and he'd get out his New World Translation. And I want to tell you something. They covered all the bases. Because every time I said, Brady, look this verse up. Because I was thinking that his New World Translation had to have said it like the King James did. Oh, no. Those guys spent years making sure that their translation of the Bible never, never allowed anybody to believe that Jesus was God. Those people are so in such bondage. And it's a book that holds them there. And, I, and with, without fail, and I don't know about this one, but without fail, it was hard for me to try to reach through that with Brady. Because I knew he knew both the New World and I knew he knew the King James. And if I could just get him to see that the New World translation actually said that Jesus was God, but every time he turned to it, they already covered that. They already wiped clean any knowledge of Jesus Christ being God Almighty. What a shame. Okay? The problem is, now the Bibles, the NIVs and stuff like that, they're reading more like the New World Translation every single day. Okay? 
Where are we at? 42.5. Then they said to Jeremiah, The Lord be a true and faithful witness between us. So you could take this verse and say, See, the one who is true and faithful is the Lord, Jehovah, which, according to Revelation 19, is Jesus Christ, because he's faithful and true. If somebody, while, they're, while I'm talking, can find a New World Translation and look up Jeremiah 42, 5, see what it says. I almost bet that they ruined it so bad that it doesn't say that anymore. Anyway, we'll move on. They said to Jeremiah, the Lord be a true and faithful witness between us, if we do not even according to all things for the which the Lord thy God shall send thee to us. Now, do you trust the Lord? He is both true and he's faithful. He's true, number one, in that he's never lied and he never will. He's also true, and this kind of goes along with the idea of faithful, in that Jesus is true to the cause that he represents. He's never going to turn his back on the cause that he represents. And what he represents is the kingdom of God, the salvation of souls, and eventually ruling and reigning for a thousand years as his father's, I guess, ambassador to this world. He's going to rule on behalf of God Almighty in heaven. He's going to rule this world, and he's never, ever, ever going to turn his back on or betray what it is that he stands for and what it is that he believes in. Now, here's the thing. You... If you believe Jesus Christ are what he stands for and what he believes in, meaning he will never turn his back on you. You ever been betrayed? You ever been done dirty? It's hard, isn't it? It's hard being betrayed by friends, family members co-workers it's hard to endure that and what it does it it makes us not want to ever stand for something or be a part of something ever again sometimes people get hurt in a church that they believed in and it makes them not ever want to be part of a church ever again sometimes people get betrayed by Politicians, that happens all the time. We put, our, we put our, our time, our investment, our votes into a certain political party only for them to turn around and betray us. They're not standing up for us. They're standing up for themselves. So all these people, Sterling, that we sent to Congress, Missouri legislature, governor's office, mayor, president, that we said, get rid of abortion, Get rid of sodomite marriage. Get rid of all this stuff. You're in charge. Get rid of it. They haven't done it. And it makes us want to not trust anybody. Rush Limbaugh, uh, af after the Republican Party kept winning the elections and having all this power and then doing nothing with it, Rush Limbaugh came out and he said, I am no longer going to be the mouthpiece and the representative for the Republican Party. I've had it with you people. We, I, he said, I keep getting you in office with what I do, and you sit there, you've got all the power in the world, and you do nothing with it. And he said, I'm sick of you guys. And so we get a man like Trump that gets in there and says, you know what, I'm sick of you guys too. I'm going to run this nation. If you want, because a lot of people came out and put me in office, and if you want their vote next time, you better get behind what I'm doing. He better not betray the people that put him in office. Okay? Or there will be a mess in this country. But here's what I'm saying. The Lord is true and faithful. To the people that put their trust in the Lord, Jesus will never turn his back on his people. He proved that already, didn't he? He went to the cross. He was offered an out. And he didn't take it. The devil tried to talk him into not going, and he wouldn't do it. He realized that he had that opportunity to save his people. He, he realized that he could not turn his back, number one, on his father, and number two, on his people. 
So he went and did it. Best thing I've ever, one of the neatest things. When I read this, it made me cry. The law prescribed that the high priest was to wear a breastplate. And on that breastplate, it had, um, it had four rows, no, three rows of four slots apiece. So there's 12 slots on this breastplate. And for, all, for each place, there was a stone put in there. And every stone had inscribed on it the name of one of the 12 tribes of Israel. And the purpose of it, and when I read this, I fell apart. When the purpose of it was God specifically said, so that when the high priest goes in on the day of atonement, to make atonement for the sins of his people, the names of his people are on his heart when he does it. And I did, I wept. And I said, God, was my name on there? Yeah. He had my name on his heart when he went to Calvary to atone for all of our sins. That's faithful. That's true. You can count on him. He's not going to turn our back on it, his back on us, people. He's going to see this through. We're the ones that turn our back. He never does. It's another aspect of this. He's a true faith, faithful witness between us. What should happen? Let's say, let's say me and John getting a knockdown drag out over some doctrine. Okay, and we both decide that the whole church needs to hear our side of the story. You know what that's going to do? It's not going to do anything good. But most of us, when we get into a fight with somebody, we start calling people, or we start notifying people, or texting them, or whatever. And we, because we want them to hear our side first so that they will be on our side. That's what we do. And that's never good. It's never good. So, what I've learned, best way to deal with it is let God be the faithful and true witness between us. That way, if John's right, then God shows me that John's right and God's not mean about it. God says, Mike, John was right. Here it is in the word. And I submit to that and I say, God, thank you. Forgive me for being a fool. And then when John's right, God shows John that John's right, but John doesn't go, I told him. God, I told him I was right. And he didn't believe me. God brings John down enough notches to where John realizes, you know what? I could have been just as wrong as he was. In fact, I will be the next time. God's going to make sure of it. So I probably won't gloat on this deal. Isn't that what we're supposed to do? Husbands and wives do that. Husbands and wives, let God handle your fights and your arguments. Let God be a true faithful witness between you. That way God can deal with one and God can deal with the other and then there's peace in the house. Amen? When there's a disagreement between mom and the kids. Mom, just beat the kids, okay? Whip them. This doesn't apply there, okay? No. It, when there's disagreement between brothers and sisters. When there's disagreement between a brother and a sister. When there's a disagreement in some place at work. There's people in workplaces that are just absolute jerks. Are there not? They're not there for you. And they let you know that they're not there for you. They're there for them. Okay? And there's just people that you have to put up with that way. Let God be a true and faithful witness. Whoever is the meekest one, God will use them and God will bless them. I considered this morning before church making my presence known again on Facebook. Because I get a little zeal in me. And what I want to do is, 
I'm sick and tired of stupid people writing stupid stuff on Facebook, and I'm going to go after them, every one of them. And God said, Mike, don't make me come down there. <laughs> it's better for me, Laura, that I practice meekness. And I have to balance my zeal for what I believe in with not answering a fool to his, according to his own folly and be meek and let God sort out who's going to believe what and who's going to say what, when, and where. The, the guy that hates me, the guy that's, okay, because I told him the other day, I'm never going to speak your name again. He wrote Lisa the other night. And it's, it's been going on. And she showed it to me. She was in a huff. And I said, number one, I am never going to speak your name again. Number two, I've instructed my wife to never answer you back. Okay? For some reason, you think that by your harassment and whatever that you can intimidate us by telling me that People are watching me, and they're going to take action against me. I don't care. It's not going to stop me. I'm going to keep doing what I do and keep saying what I say. I won't tell you whatever else I told him, because it was directed to him. But I said, as of tonight, I'm done. And I'm not going to worry about you ever again. And that was it. I, I didn't say, I love you, I'm praying for you. I was done with him, okay? I've gone as far as I can, and it's over with. The best, and that's not what I wanted to do, because I'm typing and I'm going, there's things I want to say here, because he's talking to my wife, and that ticks me off. But God, let God be true, and every man a liar, and so I just decided the meekest course was the best, Okay? Now, I can't say that is the case for every little situation, but what I'm telling you is God has shown me that as far as the social media arguments and stuff like that, I'm staying out of them. I'm going to keep saying what I say, and I'm going to keep doing it seven to eight times a week every week. Okay? And if that's not enough, God help me do more. But the idea is... God knows me, God knows them, God knows how to fix all the arguments and all the fights, and God knows how to either convince people how wrong they are a whole lot better than I do. So I'm going to let God do it. Amen? Let's turn to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Verse 1, and we're going to cover all the way down to verse 13. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not and there are just some people that we are not going to reach amen there's going to be some people that are going to take our dvds when they get them and toss them in the trash immediately i would rather that our dvds end up in somebody's trash can than i would from to just be sitting on the shelf in here that's what I would rather, because then I know that the process is working. Nobody's going to come here and take all of our DVDs and dump them out in a dumpster and say, I'm sick of you people, okay? They're not going to do that. They're not hurting anybody sitting here, okay? They're not having an effect sitting here. I would rather somebody be throwing them away somewhere, because that tells me that the process, like, Luke 4, the parable of the seed and the sower. Some fell by the wayside. I get it. That means that some others are going to find some good ground somewhere. All I want's one. 
All at once, one. Okay? So anyway, darkness comprehended it not. Verse 6, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, meaning John, was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the what? True, true light. The true light. Which lighteth every man that cometh in the world. Back in the old days before, um, before GPS satellites and before modern navigation systems, when people approached a harbor, what were they looking for, John? They were looking for the light, weren't they? They saw that light. They knew where to turn, where to go, that they were close. Okay? It's the light that, that they know there's safety in the light. If there's no light, they're afraid because anything could happen. You're talking about men holding lanterns over the edge of a boat, trying to see their way through dark waters in the middle of the night, hoping they don't run ashore. And a lot of them did. But as long as they saw that light, they knew that that's where their safety was. And that light was always going to be true. Amen. Uh, lighthouses were not known for moving about, were they? You stand them up, you put them on solid ground, and there they are. They never move. Amen? That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Your DNA. Your DNA is made of phosphorus. It's light. It, it's true. Every man, every human being has the lighted word of God in them. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came into his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received them, him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but God. There are four things in verse 13. Three of them you cannot be saved by. The fourth one's different. Do you see that? They were born not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And if you're born of God, you have that absolute, true light. Now, as I'm doing this, and I'm, I'm, I got a lot more to give you, and I'm not going to try to extend this to try to get it all in. But in everything that I'm telling you, you know that behind it is me saying your Bible is right 100% of the time. This Bible is the light. It says so at the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It's the Word. Jesus is the Word. Your Bible is the Word. So, if Jesus is the light, then your Bible is the light. Is there a second witness to that? Give me a verse. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, light unto my path. Give me another one. Huh? Thy word is, you're, you started out great. Now we're dealing with light. I am the light of the world. Okay, that's Jesus. Entrance of thy words. Yeah, I know he'd say it. Giveth, giveth light. The entrance of thy words giveth light. So Jesus is the light, the Word is the light. Jesus is true, the Word is true. Amen? It always goes together. So, in Matthew 25, turn there. When you have five virgins, and they are ten virgins, and all ten of them have lamps. Let me ask you a question. What is a lamp? That you cannot light. What is it? Decoration. It's a decoration. How many of you have like an old lantern in your house, like on a mantle somewhere? Or, okay. No oil in it, right? Oh, there is? They're ready to go. Okay. Could have worked with me a little bit, Chris. Okay. 
Yeah. Okay, I'll do this. How many of you have old flash, not old non-LED flashlights that the battery acid has oozed out in it? Everybody's got some of those. What are they good for, Jared? Absolutely nothing. They're good for nothing. Look at this, look at this passage. Five of them were wise, five of them were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps, took no oil with them. You have a Bible that will not light. The wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. They have lamps that will light. When the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. At midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all the virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. All of them did. They all trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. Now watch this. The phrase, are gone out, tells you that at one time, those lamps were lit. Here's what happens. I've seen it in my lifetime. A church used to believe the Bible. They used to preach the Bible. You talk to Sister Linda Carmichael. She is very worried about a certain church. You ask her about it, she'll tell you. She said she has seen in her life that church go from, they used to believe the Bible, used to preach the Bible, to she shakes her head now and says, it's bad what they're preaching. They're not getting anything. Pastor's got these little prepackaged sermonettes, gives everybody the little handout, and they're out in 20 minutes, gone. And she said, There's nothing there. And she, she can't say anything because of who she's with that's there. She can't say anything. So she comes back and tells us that. At that one time, that church used to preach and believe the Bible, they had their lamp lit at one time. I used to belong to a denomination of men that I looked up to, that I thought I could count on them to never move and never go away from the Bible. And it hurt my feelings when I found out they didn't believe it anymore. They weren't going to stand by it anymore. And they didn't want me around saying that the Bible was right in everything that it said. They did not want me around saying it. So I just pulled out. That's how they're going to be. That's how they're going to be. I'm not here to fight, not here to argue with everybody. But there are churches, there are people, there are denominations everywhere that used to believe the Bible. And their lamps were lit. But they let the oil run out. And now they just, they're a church, right? And we have a Bible sitting here, right? It looks good. It's nice furniture. But we're not going to use it. We're going to use everything else. We're going to use pseudo light. But we're not going to use the real light. Okay? So, um, the virgins arose, trimmed their lamps, foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. The wise answered, saying, Not so. Lest there not be enough for us and you, but go rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went out to buy, the bridegroom came. And them that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. So, brothers and sisters, don't let the oil run out. What's the best way, best way you know that you've got plenty of oil? Keep the lamp lit. Keep the lamp lit. Gets a little faded every now and then, dump some oil in it. Poof, it'll come right back up, won't it? Every time. The lamp itself is the Bible. I think the oil is their belief in it because they, it ran out. That lamp used to light their path, and it doesn't anymore. It quit lighting their path, and they got fine with that. Okay? They got fine with it. Yeah, we have lamps. What do we need oil for right now? He's not coming back, is he? Because a lot of these churches they don't preach prophecy anymore. They don't preach the Lord's coming back anymore. So what does it matter to them? Okay? So, folks, keep it lit. Keep it lit.
always. That way, when it's time for the marriage, you'll be there. You read Revelation 19, before the Lord descends, there's a marriage table and the wedding feast and the bride gets fitted with her nice gown. Aren't you ready for that, ladies? Us, not so much, but ladies, you get it, right? We could have, uh, guys, we could have just thrown on a suit. Okay, we're ready for the marriage. Took us, what, 10 minutes to get ready? Took our wives like eight days. Okay, let's stand to our feet. He was that true light. That means that every word in your Bible is always true. Always true. It's never wrong. God's never going to lie to you. He's never going to deceive you. And he has not left it up to men to decide what God said and what God didn't say. God decided that. Father in heaven, we we'll love you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the light of the world. Thank you, Lord, for lighting that light in us so we could see. And Lord, I get it. Some people don't like the light because there are things that they just don't want to see. But Lord, we need that light. And we need to see some things. Because we need to let you fix them. We need to let you do something about it. So Lord, please, keep our lamps lit for us. Keep us in our, in our Bibles. Keep our faith strong in what this book says. Not in what man says it says. Not in what man says. But what this book says. Father, I pray this week that somebody here, there, anywhere, hearing my voice, God, you would show them something in the Bible that they never saw before. And it would just almost produce a shout in them as tears ran down their face in joy that you showed them great and mighty things from your word. God, do that for your people. Do it for me. But do it for those, Lord, that turn to your word. And they see things they never saw before because they believe what it says. Lord, would you do that for my people this week? Not only light their lamps, but make them real bright for a time. Bless your people today, I pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.